the uh, reasoning that uh, the scientists think there was a fluke on rhodocytus um, based on the other pieces of anatomy? Well, I told you we don't have the tail in rhodocytus. So we don't know for sure whether it had a ball vertebra indicating a fluke or not. So I speculated it might have had a fluke. ...as being the sort of toolbox of subroutines, which is pretty much common to all mammals. I mean, all mice and men have the same number, roughly speaking, of protein-coding genes, and that's always been a, a bit of a blow to the self-esteem. I have noticed that there are some creationists who are jumping on it because they think that's awkward for Darwinism. Um, quite the contrary, of course, it's exactly what a Darwinist would hope for. And even pseudogenes that don't do anything but are vestigial relics of genes that once that once did something. Now, this is massive, massive, massive quantities of evidence left lying around the earth in every species of creature that's ever been looked at is carrying around massive quantities of evidence in the DNA. It's like fragments of a document on your hard disk which are no longer being used. They're no, no longer on the directory, so you won't see them. Creationists who are jumping on it because they think that's awkward for Darwinism. Is the traces, the remains, you see the, uh, the consequences of the evolutionary process. And you find that it forms a perfect branching hierarchy. It's a tree. And what else could that tree be but a family tree? You find that they form a perfect hierarchical pattern. It's a family tree. You plot out the resemblances and they fall on a perfect hierarchy, a perfect family tree. But evolution in the sense that life came from non-life and then that life began to randomly generate new genetic information and over time it eventually produced humans is something entirely different and something that quite honestly doesn't hold up against science. In other words, evolution in the sense of molecules to man is not scientifically plausible and therefore should not be viewed as scientific fact. Quite honestly, it is in great opposition to science, that is, observational science, the kind of science we can test and repeat and use our five senses to understand. Science demonstrates that over time, living organisms lose genetic genetic information. They don't gain it. That same science demonstrates that life doesn't arise from non-life. Hey, Follow along from? if you would. Fact one, there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to an organism's genetic code. None. That pretty much refutes evolution right away because there's no way to go from a fish to an amphibian without adding new information, right? If living organisms cannot produce new genetic information, how can anything gradually change into something of higher intelligence or form or complexity? That is, how can anything evolve from an amoeba to a man without adding new genetic information? The answer, of course, is that it can't. Plain and simple. Now, some have speculated and they have imagined all kinds of things and they brought in artists to produce creative renderings based on guesses and they have been successful in telling a very convincing story that humans evolved from ape-like creatures, but those are just drawings, people. They're just stories. But what we really observe is humans are humans and apes are apes. Now, if fact one buried evolutionary thinking deep into the Precambrian soil, this next fact, fact two, tosses so much sediment on it that not even the greatest team of paleontologists with the latest subterranean gizmo could dig up the remains. Check this out. Never, again, never has it been observed that life can come from non-life. So here are two major scientific evidences against evolution. I reiterate for clarity, life has never been observed to come from non-life, and there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to the genetic code of an organism. So molecules to man evolution doesn't really make scientific sense. Yet we are all here, and life is all around us in various forms. Professor Roberto Fondi is a specialist in paleontology. He teaches at the Department of Earth Sciences in the University of Siena in Italy. You may be surprised to know that the fundamental assumptions upon which evolutionary thinking is based are not at all confirmed by paleontology. All the biological groups, from bacteria and blue-green algae to men, appear abruptly in the fossil record without any links connecting them with each other. Why is it then that so many people believe the fossils prove evolution?
Evolution is presented to grown-ups and taught to the very young as a fact that has been verified and demonstrated for so long that it is a waste of time and even ridiculous to question it. So, what is the truth of the matter? Well, there is a history book of the past and that is the rocks and the fossilized remains in them. So, it is up to the paleontologist to read that book and give the answer. And what do you read in that book, Professor? In questo libro io leggo semplicemente che The fact is that after nearly two centuries of intense research, the paleontological evidence for evolutionary theory is not only rare, but highly questionable. The point is that if evolution had really happened, the evidence would be in great abundance and incontestable. The museums would be overflowing with fossils, clearly documenting the transitions between the various biological groups. Yet there are none. Moreover, there is no indication that the situation will change in the future. Those very few fossils, which are claimed to show some kind of evolutionary link, such as the amphibians, Ichthyostica and Simoria, the reptile, Propnognathus, the bird, Archaeopteryx, and the Australopithecine ape, called Homo habilis, are very far from conclusive. Evolutionists concocted the scenario of human evolution. The most important role of this scenario is given to the extinct ape species called Australopithecus. The first Australopithecus fossil was found in 1924 by a paleontologist named Raymond Dart. Since then, evolutionists argue that this ape species, the name of which means southern ape, is a man-like creature. However, when Australopithecus and chimpanzee skeletons are compared, it is seen that there is no important difference between the two. In the face of this fact, evolutionists hypothesized that Australopithecus walked upright on its two feet differently from other apes. However, two world-renowned anatomists, Lord Solly Zuckerman and Professor Charles Oxnard, refuted this allegation. Simply put, Australopithecus advanced as the ancestor of man by evolutionist is merely an extinct ape species. The other hand, fossils that are included by evolutionists under imaginary classifications such as Homo erectus, Homo ergaster, or Homo sapien archaic, in fact belong to different human races. When these fossils are inspected, it is seen that their skeletons are essentially the same as those of people living today. The only dissimilarities are a few structural differences in their skulls. But differences like these are to be found in different human races alive on Earth today. Famous evolutionist paleontologist Richard Leakey admits that the difference between the skulls classified as Homo erectus and those of modern men is only racial. These differences are probably no more pronounced than we see today between the separate geographical races of modern humans. The only evidence at hand is generally nothing more than a few skull fragments or a tibia. The hair, skin, nose, ears, lips, or other facial features of a living being cannot be determined from its bone remains. Ernest Hooten from Harvard University states that these drawings have no scientific value. You can, with equal facility, model on a Neanderthaloid skull the features of a chimpanzee or the lineaments of a philosopher. These alleged restorations of ancient types of man have very little, if any, scientific value and are likely only to mislead the public. Evolutionists go so far in this subject that they can even invent very different faces for the same skull. The 
are three entirely different reconstructions made for the fossil calls in Santropus. There's a famous example showing how persistent evolutionists are in producing these false masks. Many other fossil skulls have been presented as great evidence for evolution failed one by one. Neanderthal man was advanced as evidence in 1856, dismissed in 1960. Piltdown man was advanced as evidence in 1912, dismissed in 1953. Zenzanthropus was advanced as evidence in 1959, dismissed in 1960. Ramapithecus was advanced as evidence in 1964, dismissed in 1979. Despite all these facts, these skulls are still presented to the public through the media and in some evolutionist textbooks as if they were scientific facts. However, Darwin was still distressed. In the chapter, Difficulties on Theory, he wrote, If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. As far as I'm concerned, I'm here to tell you, Michael, this morning and Jason, evolution is dead. Long live the creator. I'll tell you why. And I'm saying science says that as a scientist. Uh, evolution is dead because there's such thing as the minimal gene set concept. They've taken a mycoplasma, smallest organism, mycoplasma genitalium, which is the smallest organism that is known to exist, has 468 genes. A gene is a mix of uh, proteins, right? Mm -hmm. a, a list of, so it can be 1,000, can be 10,000 amino acids. Okay, they're 486, and they've decided since year 2000, they've said, let's take them, let's try to reduce it. Because we have to start, if you're going to be an evolutionist, you have to start with zero genes and build up if you're going to go from hydrogen to human. And so, somewhere along the way, they said, well, let's take it down. In the year 2000, they published that even on paper, they couldn't go below uh, 200 genes. In, on the 6th of January, 2006, in Nature, they published that in reality, you could only go down to 397 genes. So, so, so a cell, which is where my specialty lies in my, my uh, scientific work, a cell needs a specific number of components to be functional. You have a membrane, but then you need to feed the membrane. So you have to have some mitochondria. You need a way of tagging the proteins. You need some DNA. So you need 397 things. Just the glucose cycle for getting en uh, energy takes over six different genes. So if you don't have one of them, you don't have any more energy coming to the cell. Darwin's fears proved to be true soon after his death. The laws of inheritance discovered by an Austrian botanist, Gregor Mendel, caused Lamarck's and Darwin's assertions to collapse. The truth that the evolutionists try so hard to deny and conceal is there for all to see. Species appeared all of a sudden and perfectly on the earth. That is, they were created. The divine creator, ruling over the whole of nature, created all kinds with their unique and perfect traits. That divine creator is Allah, the one and only God. He is the Lord of the heavens, the earth, and all that is between them.